Suicide is the leading cause of death for young teens in Nebraska and the second leading cause of death for older teens. We'll talk more about what's being done to prevent teen suicide with a statewide expert and a mother who lost her son to suicide. That's tonight on Speaking of Nebraska. Thanks for joining us on Speaking in Nebraska. I'm NET News Director Dennis Kellogg. Before we get started, we want you to know that this episode will include discussion about a sensitive topic, suicide. Rates of depression and anxiety among young people are on the rise across the nation. One in six high school students nationwide reported seriously considering suicide in the past year. And the suicide rate for 10 to 19 year olds increased 33% from 1999 to 2014. Here in Nebraska, the suicide rate for ages 10 to 24 has nearly doubled since 2013. A quarter of Nebraska high school students reported feeling depressed in the past year, and one in three Native Americans in Nebraska has anxiety or depression. Many organizations are focused on prevention, including the Kim Foundation based in Omaha. We want to show you a public service announcement from the Kim Foundation. This is part of their effort to reach out to the community about suicide prevention. Suicide takes a life every 13 minutes. In Nebraska, the same number of people die by suicide as in car accidents each year. A simple conversation and knowing the warning signs could save a life. Do you know someone? Who's lost hope. Who talks about wanting to die. Is withdrawn. Is giving away possessions. Talks about being a burden. There is hope. To learn more, visit 13minutes.org. If you or someone you know needs help, call the Lifeline number. Suicide is preventable. Together, we can. Save a life. Stop suicide. Joining us now is Julia Hebenstreit, the executive director of the Kim Foundation, and Mindy Egert, the, uh, a suicide survivor, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, but thank you both for coming on to Speaking of Nebraska and talking with us about what is certainly a difficult subject. Uh, Julia, I want to I want to start with you. The statistics can be discouraging when it comes to youth, si youth mm -hmm. suicide in Nebraska. Suicide, the leading cause of death for 10 to 14 year olds, and the second leading cause for those older teens and young adults. So you're dealing with this issue on a daily basis. Tell us where do we stand? What's the situation like? Is it getting better or worse? Mm -hmm. You know, I think we as a state are doing a better job in terms of addressing suicide and suicide prevention. We still have a long ways to go, um, but I think truly even across the country, you we're approaching it now as a public health crisis, as it should be. Um, we aren't talking about it as much as we should be, um, but we're getting better. I think, you know, we, in, as a state of Nebraska, we lose more people to suicide um, than we do car accidents each year. And, you know, you're driving down I-80 and you see the electronic billboards with traffic deaths to the day. We're not having that same conversation about suicide and we need to be. So there's a lot of room for opportunity for growth, but um, we are getting better, certainly. Mindy, you spend a lot of time traveling around, volunteering, talking to different groups about suicide prevention. You know firsthand the pain that a parent can suffer, uh, someone who's affected by suicide. Your son Cameron died by suicide at the age of 20. Can you tell us a little bit about Cameron? Cameron was a terrifically funny, uh, dry witty kid, popular, athletic, of course handsome, uh, <laughs> kid that just uh, towards the end of his life, felt as if he had no purpose. And that's kind of what led to his um, taking his own life. Were there, were there specific signs that looking back now you could see that, that, you, uh, that he might have been uh, giving out? Certainly, hindsight's always 20-20. Um, I've done a lot of educating myself since that time and uh, a lot of the signs and things that I saw was the withdrawal, um, becoming more independent, um, even from his friends and not wanting to even go out and celebrate his own 20th birthday. Uh, we lost him just two weeks after his birthday and uh, he just didn't have that urgency to want to go out. Um, he had never even had a job because he had a little bit of a social anxiety. Mm -hmm. 
So, Julia, uh, childhood and teen years can be rough. They can be an emotional roller coaster. Mm -hmm. So, as a parent, what are those signs that they should be looking for? Maybe the difference between a teen just having a rough day or two and a teen who may be considering hurting themselves. Yeah, absolutely. And that's the, that's an important point. You have to differentiate between what is normal teenage behavior and hormones than mm -hmm. what is something that you know you need to be more concerned and take action with. So, any of the signs we talk about, you know, they say that the key time frame is two weeks or longer that someone's experiencing these but I always say go with your gut like if you have if you're concerned about someone have that conversation ask a question so you want to watch for are they withdrawing from their friends and family um, previously enjoyed activities not necessarily just in one area maybe they quit the soccer team or something that's not maybe as alarming but if they quit the soccer team aren't going out for their birthday aren't spending time with friends um, aren't going to church group or you know whatever it may be across different spectrums of their life that's a concern um, troubles, a change in their sleeping or eating pattern. So maybe eating too much or eating too little, sleeping too much or too little, just what's a change from their pattern before. Um, you often see teens writing um, or expressing thoughts of death, maybe not necessarily their own death, but really taking an interest in death overall. Um, and that can be alarming, certainly, if that was not something they were, were interested in before. And you can see sometimes they're even turning this into school for English projects. You'll see them posting on social media about it. Um, and so just watching for that conversation about death. Um, there's giving away prized possessions or things that they previously enjoyed. They're typically giving those away to someone that they had that in common with. And so you want to, again, go with that gut feeling. If someone gives you something or you're noticing something of your teens is gone, which was very important to them before, ask that question and, and bring it up. Don't avoid it because that's often easier to do, but not what you want to do. You need to have that conversation and ask the hard questions. We're speaking with uh, Julia Hebenstreit of the Kim Foundation in Omaha and also Mindy Eggert, a suicide survivor. And that term, let's talk about suicide survivor. You, you do a lot of suicide prevention, but you, you're a suicide survivor. Yes. And the difference between a lot of people think that a suicide survivor is somebody who's actually attempted. Well, that would be an attempt survivor. And in the world where so many of us have lost someone to suicide, we have that title of suicide survivor. Mm -hmm. And that's basically what we do is we continue and try to survive. And um, so somebody that has lost a loved one or someone they care about is a suicide survivor versus someone who has made an attempt and survived that is a law, an attempt mm -hmm. loss survivor. Right. So there may be parents sitting out there watching this program and asking, what should I do if I think that my teen is considering suicide? The Mayo Clinic has a video regarding this. I want to show you a portion of it, then I'm going to ask you about it. Sure. Okay. So if you think your kid's acting different, if she seems like a different person, say something. Say, what's wrong? How can I help? And ask straight out, are you thinking about killing yourself? It doesn't hurt to ask. In fact, it helps. When people are thinking about killing themselves, they want somebody to ask. They want somebody to care. Maybe you're afraid you'll make it worse if you ask. Like, you'll put the idea in their head. Believe me, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't hurt to ask. In fact, the best way to keep a teenager from killing herself is to ask, are you thinking about killing yourself? That's a difficult conversation to have, but one that could make all of the difference. So mm -hmm. you're, supposed to, you're supposed to bring the subject up. You're mm -hmm. supposed to talk about it, right? Yeah, definitely. Ask the question. And again, you know, it's not something we're comfortable asking. And sometimes it's easier to say, are you thinking of hurting yourself? Are you thinking of harming yourself? And the truth is it's better to be very direct with it. Are you thinking of killing yourself? Are you thinking of dying? Because someone who's truly depressed and truly suicidal is in so much pain that if you ask them, are you thinking of hurting yourself? they're thinking, no, I'm going to end that pain, you know. And so try and be direct with the question, as difficult as it is. And it's okay to even role play it, you know, within your family as parents or, you know, uh, with your youth. Just ask that question so that when it comes time, you can you have the courage to say those words. And so are you thinking of killing yourself? Are you thinking of suicide? You, it's been proven time and time again to be a myth that you're going to put that idea in their head. Um, it's important to ask that question, and most people who are struggling are truly appreciate the opportunity. Opportunity to, to talk about it, but also to know someone cares enough to ask. 
And we want to make sure that everyone out there, whether you're a teen or not, who is contemplating hurting themselves or has questions about how to get to the resources, there are resources out there. One of them is the National Lifeline. That phone number is 1-800-273-TALK, and we'll put that up throughout the program. Uh, Julia, talk about that resource and what other resources are available. Yeah, for definitely. The, suicide, the National Suicide Lifeline is a wonderful resource, and we encourage parents, too, if you're really struggling and you're not equipped to have that conversation, you can call that number on speaker with your youth. Um, and so they, a trained crisis counselor is going to answer. There's about 200 call centers throughout the country, so you're routed to the most local one for you most often. And so a trained crisis counselor is going to answer, assess the situation, assess the severity of it, and really talk you through that and connect you to resources within your community. Um, there's also 13minutes.org is a public service um, campaign, a public awareness campaign on suicide prevention um, in the region. Region 6, Nebraska area, so the five counties around um, Omaha, and it really is relevant across the state of Nebraska, and it has talking points on there, even gets into how to set the room, like make sure you have resources on hand, have, you know, make sure it's quiet and private, and, and talks you through, these are the things you can say, or it also has the warning signs, and you can scroll over them and give real-life examples of what that might look like in your teen, and so that's another great resource, 13minutes.org. Mindy, with Cameron's death, what are the resources that you relied on? How did, can you talk about how you tried to and continue to work through that grief? Well, quite honestly, we didn't have the resources in our face when suicide became a part of our family. And so we had to do a lot of searching, unfortunately, after the fact. He did make an initial attempt three months prior to his final. And so, therefore, in that situation, we were able to or I was able to get out there and start educating myself, dig deeper into the resources that I could find at that time. But as Julia said, there just there just is never enough information being shared and to, people are too afraid to say the word. Even Cameron didn't want me to tell any of his friends that he was hospitalized the first time. So that in itself says, you know, there's such this shame and the stigma that goes along with it. And that hits the survivors too, mm -hmm. the survivors end up not wanting to talk about it because they think it's going to create that desire in someone else to do it. And it's quite the opposite. Mm -hmm. Studies have shown that the more we talk about it, the more people learn that they're not alone, especially, you know, attempt survivors as well as the survivors themselves because too many people that I've talked to and become encountered with over the last six and a half years have totally found out that, gosh, someone else feels the same way, be it an attempt survivor or somebody that's contemplating suicide or a, a survivor themselves. So, yeah. And if I could just add sure. to that really Absolutely. quickly, I think that's one thing as a state we can really do. And as a society, you normalize that conversation around mental illness and behavioral health so that when, you know, people are worried about loved ones, it's easier to have that conversation. They know what resources are out there and they don't have to search when they're already in crisis mode because you need the information and the conversation earlier so that when you get to crisis, if you get there, you know what to do and where to turn. Mm -hmm. So, Julia, let's talk a little bit about uh, some of the statistics that are out there. And some of the studies have shown a breakdown across gender, uh, that uh, it's been more thought of that the girls may think of suicide more often, but uh, the boys are more likely to die by suicide. Uh, recent studies show that that gender gap may be closing. Is that what you're seeing? Mm -hmm. You know, we're still seeing, traditionally it's been men um, die by suicide or males die by suicide approximately four times more than females. Um, locally, we're still seeing that number, but the gap is closing a bit. And females tend to attempt more often, like you said, think about it, but also follow through with an attempt. Um, they're just typically using less lethal means, and so the death numbers are higher by males. And so that's one distinction there. But we certainly are seeing um, those trends change just a bit. Where I wouldn't say enough to, to know yet whether, we're, whether that's going to continue, but um, we'll see as, as that plays out a little bit. 
And, and what about by race and ethnicity? Eth ethnicity? A Ball State University study just showed that African-American teens, the suicide rate from 2001 to 2017, jumped 60% for African-American boys and 182% for African-American girls. Mm -hmm. Do we see that here as well? Um, locally here, you know, I, I can't speak to whether that, that number would hold true. We are seeing a little bit more in terms of the attempts and, and, um, and deaths by suicide, but more so what some of the national studies are showing as well as that 10 to 14 year old um, for African Americans that age group has seen significant increases just in the last two years whereas then uh, 14 to 19 have um, not jumped quite as high and so it's interest I think we'll see some more data come out around that and some more studies but it is interesting and it can play into you know it really there's a lot of risk factors that vary depending on population and so it's important to look at it as a whole and realize some things may be risk factors and so again what can we do to build up the protect protective factors around youth depending on what their background and where they you know what has brought them to the point where they are now. Mindy Ager to someone who's been through this on a very personal uh part of it. Uh, is there anything that you look out and say, I wish the government or the legislature or the schools would do this to help the situation? <laughs> do you want the whole list? <laughs> the top ten. <laughs> the biggest thing they have to do is just acknowledge it. They, it seems like they just don't want to invest the money in it. And the studies are there for all kinds of other things. And we need to really put the emphasis on that. It's a public health issue and we need to really address it like that and they need to give it a little better look like that to get people talking you know if if our higher-ups in the government can't even say the word how is anybody else supposed to be comfortable with saying it Julie, I want to ask you too about social media. A lot of it has been talked about the isolation that that brings yeah. uh, brings about, and of course, teens are heavy users of social media. How much of an impact do you think that has? Yeah, on I, suicide? I think it, it certainly has, and it, it can be a contributing factor for some. Um, you know, this current generation is unlike any we've ever seen, right? And they their experiences are much different. Their relationships are much different than when we were growing up, um, and so they don't have maybe those strong one-on-one -on -one connections or they don't have that strong network around them because social media does, as you said, tend to isolate an individual and that can lead to some depression and anxiety. Um, you know, they also, it, it impacts their coping mechanisms and, and their instant gratification. And so, you know, we could have a whole nother segment on social media mm -hmm. alone. And so, but I think it is important for people to monitor that and watch for it as a contributing factor or potentially could be a contributing factor for sure. Mindy, so having lost Cameron to suicide, why do you choose to go out and talk with groups? Because you know that it just puts you right back in that same situation. You have to deal with it over and over again. Why do you make that choice? Because from day one, I decided that his death was, was not going to be the description of his life. And anybody that is feeling the way Cameron did or we did or do and his friends and family I don't want anybody else to suffer those feelings of pain and be it his pain or the pain that follows afterwards with the survivors and I just want to keep even just one more person from having to experience that because there's just far too much of it, it if you open your mouth and you start talking to somebody, you realize it's touched their life, and that's that ripple effect. Well said. Thank you so much. Julia Hibbenstreit of the Kim Foundation and Mindy Eggert, a suicide survivor. Thanks for being on Speaking in Nebraska. Thank you. Thank you. This interview and tonight's program are available on our website. Just go to netnebraska.org slash speakinginnebraska. Also online, you can find the news team's daily signature stories. This week, Brandon McDermott looks at how Nebraska schools are working to destigmatize mental health and provide students with treatment. And Monday marks 50 years since the USS Evans sank, killing 74 service members, including three brothers from Niobrara, Nebraska. Watch for those stories on our website at netnebraska.org slash news.
The Nebraska legislature is wrapping up its 2019 session, passing lots of bills, but also failing to pass legislation on some pretty big subjects. Here to talk about that is NAT News Capitol reporter Fred Knapp. So, Fred, let's start with one of the major pieces of legislation that did pass, the budget. Lots of talk and debate as always, but in the end, the governor signed the budget the legislature passed. Exactly, with no line item vetoes. Uh, it was a $9.3 billion two-year plan. That's about $2,400 per Nebraskan per year that the state's spending. And uh, they wound up within a tenth of a percent in the legislature of what the governor had recommended. There were some minor differences. Uh, the uh, governor had recommended $7 million for scholarships for high-wage, high-demand jobs. That didn't make it. Uh, the legislature did provide a bigger pay increase and uh, to more people for Medicaid providers. So there were some minor differences. So a couple of efforts that failed did so because what appeared to be a battle again between urban and rural senators. So we're starting to see that divide surface again. Right. And this year it played out in the form of uh, corporate tax incentives, which were favored by the chambers of commerce and uh, uh, many urban senators and uh, uh, property tax relief, which was a priority of a lot of uh, rural senators. So um, when one didn't make it, that is to say the property tax, then uh, that doomed the other one, so they're both in limbo. But lawmakers did do something on property tax relief, and it was related to a proposal that was championed by Governor Pete Ricketts. What kind of relief is that going to bring to property owners in Nebraska? Well, it's $51 million additional each of the next two years to an existing property tax credit fund. Now, uh, that's a credit fund that provides about $86 worth of relief for a homeowner of a $100,000 house, about $1,000 worth of relief to the owner of a million dollars worth of farmland. So those will both go up, but it'll be $106 for a house and $1,280 for a million dollars worth of farmland. It's $275 million a year that that costs. To put that in perspective, it comes against a $4.2 billion property tax system. So um, that, that credit that the money will go to has been around since 2007. And while it has held down the size of property tax increases, they've still continued to go up from $2.5 billion back then to four, more than $4 billion now. So, and they've always gone up, and since 1999, they've gone up more than $51 million a year. So it seems unlikely that a $51 million increase in that credit fund is going to reverse that trend. So safe to say we haven't seen the end of the efforts for more property tax relief. Absolutely. Um, there are some issues that could end up being handled at the ballot box instead of on the floor of the legislature. Give us a preview of what voters could see in 2020. Well, there are two things that they will definitely see. One is a... Uh, put on the, by the legislature. It's a proposed constitutional amendment to do away with a provision in the Constitution that allows slavery in the case of people who commit a crime or involuntary servitude. And the other is a sweetening of the property tax TIF incentives for highly blighted, high poverty uh, areas. The petition drives that are out there and may make it on the ballot include a 35% uh, rebate of your property taxes paid for out of state income taxes with no uh, consideration given to where that money is going to come from in terms of existing programs or tax increases. Um, and there's uh, medical marijuana and recreational marijuana. So we'll see if those make it onto the ballot. Fred Knapp, thanks for watching the legislature for us. Thanks. And Fred has been updating us on the latest news from the Nebraska legislature each day of the session. Tune in to NET Radio on Tuesday for his final report summarizing the session and analyzing what lawmakers accomplished. Listen for that report on Tuesday at 6.45 and 8.45 in the morning and 4.45 and 6.45 in the afternoon on NET Radio. You can also find our stories on Facebook and Twitter. Just follow us at NET News Nebraska. As Nebraskans continue to deal with the effects of historic flooding in March, they're also working through additional rain this week. Allison Molenkamp joins us now to talk about what's been going on. Allison, as far as the roads are concerned, first they were closed because of the flooding, then they were reopened, and now some of them are closed again. 
Yes, with the, the heavy rains this week, some of those roads have reclosed I-29 and the section of Highway 2 between the Nebraska border and I-29. Um, both had reopened briefly, I think for maybe as much as two weeks on I-29, but those have both now reclosed a pretty significant section of I-29 because there is water very close to and in some cases covering the roads in those areas. And so it's not safe to drive and so it's been closed down and so uh, the plan or the hope at this point is that the water may recede sometime next week possibly midweek and at that point the department of transportation can evaluate damage and eventually get those roads back open to the public so a lot of this impacts the i-29 corridor in southeast nebraska and when that is closed when that stretch of i-29 is closed what does that do to the traffic pattern yeah, so officially the detour that's recommended by the Department of Transportation is to take I-80 from Omaha to Des Moines and then 35 long trip. <laughs> south to St. Joseph in Missouri, but that is a much longer drive, a lot more miles, um, but it would keep people on interstate. So what some people are doing instead is uh, taking Highway 75 south through southeast Nebraska. The Highway Patrol says they've seen maybe three times as much traffic on that when 29 was closed before. Um, and and so that's put a lot more traffic through Auburn, Nebraska, which is on the one hand pretty good for business, three and times more, three and four times more business for gas stations and restaurants, but on the other hand is a lot of traffic through that area on a road that is not used to it. And you've spent some time down there this week. Uh, talk a little bit about how the people feel about that additional traffic. Is it really impacting their lives? Yes. Yeah, so one uh, one person that I talked to at a local restaurant talked about feeling like it's messing up the traffic within that town. If people just need to take the road for a couple miles, if they have to sit five minutes trying to turn onto the highway, that's very unusual for them and they, they just want their small town back. But on the other hand, it is good for business and maybe that sales tax will, will cheer people up a little bit later in the year. But right now there's sort of a frustration with that traffic and also with, with things being bumper to bumper and there have been a couple fatality crashes since that closure. Speaking about frustration, uh, let's talk about farmers all across eastern Nebraska. Again, this is a crucial time for them trying to get in the fields, but a lot of them can't. Yes, so uh, flooding obviously impacted a lot of farmers earlier in the year, and that makes it difficult to plant those fields. But also with these heavy rains, it's been harder to get out and into fields when you can plant. Um, so the USDA estimated that in last week there were only t uh, just over two days that were suitable to go out and plant, which is not very much time in a whole week. Um, and the amount of crops that have been planted is pretty significantly behind right now. Um, as of this last report, there were 81% uh, of corn was in the ground and the average usually is 94% at this time of year. And for soybeans, it was 56% this year, but that should be around 74%. Last year, it was as high as 84 um, with Soybeans, there is a little more time, possibly as late as mid or late June, that they can keep planting, but corn kind of are running out of time on that. Yeah, it's getting really to a crucial <laughs> time, and uh, gonna, a lot of decisions that need to be made by farmers deciding whether or not to plant if, if it gets down to that deadline. Yes, and some of this, it looks like, is already impacting the commodity prices on corn and maybe rising, raising that because there's less supply. We'll continue to watch it. Thanks, Allison. Allison and all of our reporters will continue to follow the impact of flooding, learn more about the transportation problems in a report from Allison on our website. It's netnebraska.org slash news. That's all for this week on Speaking of Nebraska. Thanks to Julia Hebenstreit and Mindy Egert for joining us. Also, Allison Mullenkamp and Fred Knapp for their reporting and all of those behind the scenes who work to bring this show to you. Next week, we'll talk about the benefits and risks of youth participation in sports. We'll leave you with the number for the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, 1-800-273-TALK. I'm NET News Director Dennis Kellogg. Thanks for joining us.